I'd like to talk to you a little bit today on the antibiotic use and stewardship in aquatic livestock production. What I'm talking about here with livestock is not aquaculture. And I like to make that distinction because the term aquaculture means both plants and animals. However, with aquatic livestock, we begin to realize that these animals are, are used, are, are processed, I mean, we eat them. Um, plus, there's also the, the aspect of, of the fish industry that's also uh, you keep in aquariums and, and uh, goldfish bowls and so forth. But I'm not here to address that. I'm rather here to try to put together a little bit of information for you to, so you can begin to um, scan the scope of what, of what this antibiotic use and what this industry is about. If you take a look at the world map, how many of you have seen this, the world as, it, as it's portrayed here? This is a legitimate world map. It's a spillhouse projection. Not that old as far as cartography is, is concerned. Perhaps in the 1990s, a Norwegian uh, put this together. What it shows, though, is to, to show the connectivity of all the waters of the world. We live on a planet that's 70% water. We can accept that. Except what we don't understand is that the creatures that live in these oceans have a desert physiology. Hmm. They live in water, but they must conserve water because of the salinity of the ocean. And so we're looking at a different creature altogether when we begin to talk about marine species. So why would we be concerned about marine species? Well, first of all, this planet only has a very limited supply of water, fresh water. Sweet water, as it's called in other cultures. One of the things that we have to remember is that our own species is beginning to push the very limits of that production, of that water, of that available stuff that we just put in a glass and swallow. We have the liberty in, in our culture to overlook some of the problems that the rest of the world has. 30% of the world has, doesn't even have potable water to drink. And so I would predict that probably by the time my great-grandchildren are coming of age <coughs> that we will probably be seeing a limit in the things that we can use water for. The first one being for our own species. Now, there are no formal programs for antibiotic stewardship that I'm, I'm aware of nor was I able to find in coming to this presentation. What I can say though is that there's quite a number of veterinarians that are working in this field that have been able to put together the concept of what does it mean to reduce and to make antibiotic use more effective. I'm perhaps a little bit on the um, edge of, of some of that philosophy because as, as I work internationally across some of these production facilities, I'm also beginning to get a picture here that our best choice would be no antibiotics, if possible, at least a very reduced little use situation. But how are, we going to, how are we going to manage that? I mean, this is a, these, these industries are new. They're relatively new. Many of these species are coming into culture without knowing even what their, <coughs> what their, what their diet requires. I think my microphone's on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Dr. John. <laughs> okay. All right, so what... I'm going, to, I'm going to just talk about not alternatives to antibiotic use, but what are perhaps some of the appropriate first responses. And one of the things that I'm finding most useful, and this is something that's already been rehearsed and, and practiced and, and refined in the other industries, and that's biosecurity. Our primary interest there is primary pathogens. And we can, we can name a, a couple of those, which I won't take time. The other one is that fish do everything in water. I mean, we do a lot of things in water, but we do very little things compared to fish. I mean, they eat, they reproduce, they defecate. Um, everything they do is done in water. So to control that environment and to modify that according to the species needs is paramount. Uh, this may even take to the point of, of uh, being able to adjust pH, adjust alkalinity. Uh, there's any number of water parameters that we have to pay attention to. Vaccination. Uh, for expected and economically important diseases. Uh, the, the primary, or probably the epitome of, of this effort is found in Norway, 
or in the 1980s, they were experiencing more and more antibiotic resistance in their salmon net pens. They took, they, they embarked on, on the adventure then of designing vaccines. And so the latest numbers that I can find for the Norwegian salmon industry is that the entire industry uses somewhere around 1,000 metric tons of antibiotics a year in their net pens. Meanwhile, the human population is looking at about 50,000 tons of antibiotics. But the biomass in the salmon farms is twice that of the human population. So the reduction has been very worth the effort, and uh, they're, seeing, they're still seeing challenges. Don't misunderstand me that way. But at least they're beginning to tip the scale in favor of the production. Clinical diagnostics for distinction of etiologies. A lot of us know what diagnostic labs are. I'm, I'm considering looking into the use of infectious indicators. The one that comes across my radar screen right now is something like procalcitonin. Within two hours of bacterial infection going systemic, it's detectable. Within four hours of the bacterial infection being controlled, it becomes undetectable. Very specific for bacteria. And I'm not going to say that procalcitonin is going to answer all of our, our dreams, but it certainly is. It's a factor that needs to be worked into our use of antibiotics. Passive immunity for contrary infections. How many of us have heard of, of using hyperimmune serum, hyperimmune egg yolk, any number of things? And we're finding in, in the fish industry that these can be uh, used advantageously uh, for some of these things that we can get better immunity out of the mammals or the birds than what we can out of the fish, so we use their byproducts, if you will, to do this. This is been discovered with shrimp uh, and using swine serum in the feed. Uh, some of the diseases are responding to it. Immunostimulants uh, for uh, innate, Im uh, innate mobilization. Um, we, we deal with species that have no acquired immunity. They respond to everything instantly and to the responses required. We also would like to mention then to discontinue or alternate some of the disinfectants. Quaternary ammonia compounds it's becoming evident now by publications and, and even our own experience that microbes are becoming resistant. In fact, some, some investigators are hard on the trail that perhaps there's a cross relationship between antibiotic resistance and, and disinfectants. And then dis, uh, genetic selection. I'm just going to put a, a star here for you to just pay attention to that uh, slide because I think that summarizes our effort. Globally, there's about 17 industrialized species. 40 countries have significant activity, which the United States is not one of. Aquatic livestock and wild fisheries catch produces more food than beef, pork, and chicken combined. So I'm sitting here with colleagues that represent some very sizable industries. Very well honed, very well tuned, very well refined, but the scale of it is small compared to what the world is looking at. Now, 3 billion people in the world presently are getting over 20% of their animal protein from fish protein, fish, shrimp, that sort of thing. In the U.S., the major species are channel catfish, rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, tilapia. Tilapia is caught on because we're finding out that they don't even need to be fed in some cases if they can absorb their nutrients from the bioflock that's in their recirculating systems. Um, Feed conversion gets real, real sweet when you start talking about species like that. Uh, we've, 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 been a, we've been aware of uh, VFDs since about 2006 when Aquaflora was, was introduced to us. Oxytetracycline is still available, but Romet uh, is not on the market. This is the limit of the antibiotics that we have to work with you know, across our species. And not all of our species even have approved antibiotics, so that works into the, the whole thing. Now, yes, we have one health authority in the United States, but we have three federal agencies regulating it. How many of you, poultry, pig, or cattle farmers, could ever see a need in asking the Natural Resource Department in your state permission to raise those animals? Okay? This is the scenario that we're working under with aquaculture, and I think it's one of the key elements that keeps us from becoming a leader in the world is just our regulatory cost. There's three categories of livestock. There's the farm conservation species and the pet fish. And I'll show you in the next slide here what some of these industries currently look like here in the United States. 
but there's inadequate disease reporting through the national um, research, uh, resource agencies. So there's a disconnect that way. I go one way. Let's go. Quick, quick snapshot. This is what the industries currently look like. They're open water. They're outside. Even the even the research down in the lower right hand corner, which happens to be a, a, an overview of, of the Iowa DNR down at Rathbun, um, is is outside. Biosecurity very difficult to accomplish. So what I'm going to leave you with is the inside view of a facility that I'm currently uh, helped design. Sorry for the automatic coming in there. It comes back to the points that I've been trying to make. This air, the, even the intake air on this facility is filtered. Filtered almost to the level of HEPA because of some of the parasites that can come in from outside air. We're also looking at locating this facility in particular in the Negev Desert of, of Israel. Can you raise fish in the, in the desert? Yes, because they live in the desert naturally. Um, this one happens to use brackish water wells, and then we, we customize the salt mix to, to balance the ions. But that's just a little bit of a story of, of what's developing, what's going on. I happen to be one that would envision a world where we uh, would use very few antibiotics. Antibiotics have actually curtailed our research in vaccine development back in the 40s when they started coming on board. I think we've got a long ways to go with our immune understanding and, and so forth, even especially in some of these lower animals. I'll leave it at that.